All right, we are good to go with the first session of Cloudburst for this year, 2017. Welcome. So I, got a, I managed to get, get a double acronym into my uh, session title. I think that's, that's, uh, that's pretty okay. Um, the resource manager is my topic. And um, the reason for the Azure resource manager and the reason for running resources in a good way in Azure is because it's slightly different to run apps in the cloud compared to what we were used to. It's not the same anymore. So what I see, I work as a consultant myself, what I see a lot is that people are either basically doing the carefree thing or the lack of knowledge thing. That's basically the, 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 the two options that I see. They don't know how to run things well, so ju they just kind of do it. They go into the Azure portal and create resources and, hey, look, I have a website and everything's fine. There's actually nothing wrong with this, not at all. I mean, it works, but it's not the most uh, efficient and most convenient way of doing things. So um, if you don't want to go that path, you need to get some new knowledge, really. And that's what this session is all about, telling you about features that are there, but from experience, I can s safely say that very few of my customers, if any, know about this at all. And um, even including companies that have been in Azure for, for many years, that have been here from, from, say, the early years of Azure, um, they still don't know about this stuff because it's, it's kind of new knowledge and it's not always easy to find that new knowledge and, and incorporate it into your process. You kind of like, we've got everything done, it's settled, we know how to do Azure, but they're not doing it well. So there are ways to optimize and do Azure really well. And I want to start with you guys real quick to say, well, thank you guys for coming. We appreciate it and I uh, hope there's people on the live stream. We'll see some numbers later. Um, <coughs> I've, I've asked, yes. Yeah, and we're going to tweet it out. Alan, have you received it yet? No, we're going to, you have it? Checking. You're checking, okay. We're going to get it uh, and we're going to tweet it out and so on. Um, thanks, um, we're going to do that. So I've, I've been asking this question for years um, and it's uh, funny because in the beginning not everybody had Azure subscriptions. Not everybody had them. But uh, let's, let's just quickly check. Do you all have an Azure subscription? I would say almost the entire room, okay? So we're past that point. But the next question is more interesting. Uh, I have or I work for a company which has a production deployment in Azure. See, that's not more than maybe half the room. So not everybody is in production in Azure. You all have Azure. You've been trying it out in some way, shape, or form, but not more than about half already uh, or still have Azure in production. I am, of course, um, Magnus Martinson, and I need to fix the slide just now. Hang on. Um, I am Magnus Martinson, and um, I run uh, LoftySoft is my company. As a consultant, I help companies get on Azure, and I've been doing that for a long time, or actually for the longest time possible, because I was the first Azure MVP in the Nordic countries. And I was in the audience when they announced Azure, the first, it was called Windows Azure back then, right? But they changed Windows to, to Microsoft Azure because otherwise a Linux machine in Azure would be called a Windows Azure Linux machine. It would be really weird. Uh, so they had to change that. Um, so I'm also what Microsoft called a regional director. It's, it's a little bit weird title. I don't work, let me repeat, I don't work for Microsoft. I run my own company, but I'm very close to Microsoft. And th this title is kind of funky because I don't work for Microsoft. I don't really, I don't have a region and I don't really direct anything. But it's, it's, uh, it means that I'm a very close partner and I, I sort of hang with Microsoft quite a lot. And so that's, that's basically what I do. And I decided to start my own company because, you know, Azure, I'm an expert and hey, lots of people need Azure. And like half this room are not in production in Azure, right? So you figure that out. I also have to call out the Global Azure Bootcamp. This is the map from last year, to be, to be fair. Uh, I don't know the exact, can you get me the exact number right now? Uh, for Global Azure Bootcamp 2018, we just announced it. Um, there's gonna, highly likely there's going to be one in Stockholm. I'm looking over there. For the people who at the people who are usually organizing in Stockholm, um, this event is huge. It's absolutely massive. It's probably we don't know, but it's highly likely the largest community event on the planet. It starts over in the Australia time zones and it rolls over all the time zones. Uh, every location will run their own event. Yeah, what's the number? Thirty-two confirmed and twenty-six pending. So fifty-eight total. 
So this year, 58 locations have signed up so far, and we only had the event announced about a week. Uh, and so uh, it's going to grow significantly. Um, and lots of locations have done this event every year. It's the fifth, sixth, fifth? Sixth. Sixth, really? Oh, gosh. Sixth uh, Global Azure Boot Camp. So all of these are user groups, and each user group will arrange a day of Azure on this date, and we all arrange them on the same day. So we have several hundreds of people involved, hundreds of MVPs, many hundreds of hours of training going on around the world, and they will arrange whatever agenda locally that you know, fits their, their local needs. And um, you know, depending on which user group it is, and there's over 10,000 attending, and our hashtag Global Azure is trending globally on that day, which is massive. We have much larger reach to people uh, with our hashtag than Microsoft have on that day. So it's it's a big thing, and it's all community. It's all fun. It's all for fun, and it's all free to attend, and it's just good times. I just kind of have to pull that up. And so, uh, very quickly, I'll move on, but very quickly, this is why we're here. Uh, the the t technology adoption life cycle dictates that any technology will kind of follow this curve uh, throughout its you know, history. If it's a bad technology, um, it's going to fall into this chasm of doom here. It's going to like, oh, this is a really cool thing, let's do that, and then it's, no, no, that's crap, and it just falls and it's forgotten. You remember WAP? <laughs> yeah, some people are old enough. Yeah, WAP was crap. Right? And so that didn't take off. But the thing is now that the cloud has really taken off and the cloud has moved into this middle two segments here. This is 80% of the market. And now uh, when a technology has grabbed hold of the ma majority section of the market, that's when it's really relevant for everyone and we're seeing this big surge of uptake. Everybody wants Azure or cloud now. Everybody wants cloud. So that's why we are and that's why this is relevant. And so what happens is, um, I was in Azure from the beginning, um, and, and in the beginning they had like three or five services in Azure. You could have a database and a website and a worker role and some storage. That was basically it. But, and this actually is getting old, this slide now, um, but it's, it's one of those slides that Microsoft created. Whenever you see a slide like this, remember this is not, this is not for you to, to actually review and remember and know all these things. This is to, get to create a mass effect. You're supposed to go like, wow, there's a lot. So can you please like, wow, there's a lot. Yeah, right, so that's the, that's the, the thing that they're aiming for here to, to show you that, oh my God, there's so many things. But that also leads to issues. You don't know what to do. Uh, you don't know where to start. I, uh, I, wanna, I wanna deploy my application. Which one do I pick? Uh, I need a database. Uh, too much overload. And so you don't know, right? Now it's a knowledge game. So if you knew, as much as possible, about as many as possible of, of these things on the board here, you can create some really interesting architectures. But if you don't know about a crucial thing, you might create an architecture which is fine, it probably works well, but it's not gonna be the one, the really good one. So there's so many things here, there's actually plenty more that are not on this screen. I checked, there's over 100 services in the Azure platform today. In fact, let me do this real quick. Do you know about that trick, by the way? You can, just, you can press B, on your keyboard when you're presenting. You can also do W, you get white, so you can do like shadow figures and stuff, uh, but you press B, you can remove the screen and you can talk. So there's over 100 services in the Azure platform. Um, and several of them, quite a few of those, are not created by Microsoft. So other vendors like SendGrid and um, there's uh, ClearDB and you know, a bunch of them are in the Azure platform as resources that you can use, same as you would use an Azure website or an Azure storage account or what have you. Uh, there are resources in Azure that are not uh, offered by Microsoft. And this, this number will keep growing over 100 services. And how do we keep track of them all? How do we make this work? Um, so you have resources in Azure such as databases and, 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 and more virtual machines and things. Um, and, and how do you handle them? How do you make sure they are secure? How do you deploy them? How do you create and provision these resources? How do you know if the resources are working as they should? How do you monitor this? How do you maintain it? And how do you know how much you spend? All of these, these questions are current things that you need to think about. And when you're doing deployment, you obviously have multiple resources. And we know all about this DevOps thing, right? 
you're supposed to be doing DevOps. Whenever you check in or push your code to your source code repository, there's supposed to be this build and deploy thing that deploys to some development environment so that you know that the build works, that the deployment works every time you check in code or push. Um, and you have multiple environments and you want to deploy to all of them and how do you know that the environments are exactly equal? All of these things are concerns that you now have and you need to sort through and figure out how to do that. So what Microsoft have done is that they have created this model called the Azure Resource Manager. Um, and, and it has this little sugar cube as, as a, a, an icon. So the Azure Resource Manager is what you use. This is the baseline of things. And uh, quickly to tell you how that works is that it has a, uh, I was telling you about all of these resources, right? All of these that could be, again, not Microsoft things as well, all of these like a plus 100 resources. Whenever a resource wants to be in Azure, uh, they need to implement this provider contract to make it a resource provider, to, to provide you guys with resources in Azure. Um, and from the other end, you'd be using tools such as uh, PowerShell, such as the portal and other things. I'm going to go through that to access these resources and, and, and manage them. Um, <coughs> and uh, the Azure Resource Manager is, in fact, a RESTful API in the middle so that you can call into this API using PowerShell, using the portal. All of those will call back to this. You can go from code as well in many, there are SDKs and stuff in many languages. So that you can call into Azure and say, configure a firewall setting on your database or what have you, whatever it is that you want to do. Scale your, your, uh, your uh, website size to, or, or a number of instances. You, you always go through this management layer to get access to that. And that's what we're talking about now. So with the resource manager, you deploy your app resources, your, not your applications, not your code, but your app resources, such as the web application onto which you deploy your web app, right? Such as the database into which you put your SQL and your data, uh, the resources as such. Uh, this is also a way to organize stuff. We're going to talk more about that, but it gives you the, the, the overall organizational structure for, for your resources. And uh, also, it, it controls, it helps you control access to the resources. Who has access to what? And that becomes critical when you have such things as, let's say, um, a DBA maybe has access to the databases, but really shouldn't have access to the websites. Um, a development team maybe have access to the development environment, but Probably, and uh, this is really cool, and most people don't do this, you can actually set it up in such a way that the development team does not have access to, they can possibly read the, the resources for the uh, production environment, but they can't change it. Which means that, uh, well, first of all, I guess a disgruntled employee can't you know, be malicious and, and, and uh, mess things up in your production environment, but more importantly, you can't make a mistake. So you can't be like, oh, I was running this SQL script on the development machine and oh shoot, I ran it in production, right? I just changed the production database. Holy crap, what do we do? If you don't have access to it, you can't do that. So it's, it's, it's these things that are crucial uh, to, to be able to control. It all starts with resource groups. And resource groups, I consider them an empty bucket. So before you create any database, web application, virtual machine, anything at all in Azure, you create a resource group. You have to create a resource group. And funny enough, you, <coughs> you, <coughs> create, excuse me, you create that resource group in uh, uh, a region. So you say, I want a resource group in Western Europe, or I want one in Southeast Asia, or Australia, or wherever. You, you create it somewhere. It needs to have a location. But you can put resources inside of that resource group that have a different location. As so, weird as that sounds, it's actually quite logical. The metadata for the resource group has to exist somewhere, so you have to give it a location. But if you have, say, a global web farm or, or storage accounts around the world, maybe you want the, those storage accounts to be in the same resource group, but they may be spread out throughout the world. They have different locations for the individual resources inside of the resource group. So it's really just a bucket to collect a few resources. That's what you do. So then you go into the Azure Resource Management thing. And I have to pull up one more thing here, my demo, my demo code. Um, I'm going to open code. Um, so um, I've been talking for a while now. Let's see if Visual Studio Code is opening up. I got it. There we go. 
I've been talking for a while now, so I guess I should be showing you something instead, right? Um, so then, behold, the simplest possible template. The Azure Resource Management is about templates. And um, a template looks like, a template looks like, it's actually, am I not on that screen now? I'm having some screen issues. Let's see, let's do duplicate. It jumped back to one screen for some reason. There we go. Uh, this is a template. Um, an empty template. It contains no resources at all, but it's the skeleton, the outline of a template. It's a string of JSON, if you will. You can store it, you can check it in, you can version it, you can do whatever you want with it because it's a file that contains a, a little blob of JSON. And uh, as you can see, it has a, a specification for some resources. It can receive parameters. You can specify your own variables. Uh, you can, oh, that's not update now. Uh, <laughs> you can have some outputs. And, um, um, and, and then inside of those uh, uh, square brackets, you will uh, list an array of resources. OK? So I'll just have a few simple examples here today, because some of you have never seen this at all. Um, how many have used ARM templates? Quite a few, but it's about half. It's less than half, right? So um, many of you have, have not used this. And, and for those of you who have, uh, we will be talking about some things that are, you know, that you can do with this uh, that hopefully not all of you have, have already done. Uh, but I need to cover the basics first. So um, this is the, the simplest possible uh, template in such a way that, that it's, it's actually empty. So let's go to one which isn't empty and uh, one that specifies just one single resource. It doesn't take any parameters. It doesn't have any outputs, no variables. It just has one simple resource. Can anyone call out which resource is it that I have here? Which one is it? A storage account, correct. It says right up there that the type is a Microsoft.storage slash storage accounts. So it is a storage account that I'm specifying in my resource template. And, and it's funny because even if you don't know, right, even if you have no idea, you can basically read this thing and kind of figure out, oh, it's a storage account in Western Europe, and I'm trying to give it a name. Okay, I see. Um, so you can kind of read it. So it's human readable, right? It's, it's a blob of JSON, a, a specification which Azure will understand. The Azure management layer will understand this, but it's also human readable. We can use it. So the way to run one of those is to use a little bit of JSON uh, sorry, a little bit of PowerShell. Um, and I'm going to first create myself a resource group. So before I do, let me show you the portal. Uh, in the Azure portal, no. In the Azure portal, I have nothing in this uh, subscription. It's a demo subscription. I don't have anything there. Uh, if I go to PowerShell and I execute this um, commandlet, which is called new Azure RM resource group, that's going to create myself one of these empty buckets that I was talking about. So if I go back and refresh here now, I have a resource group, an empty bucket in Azure called ARM for the win. Um, and that's an internal name, so you can name them whatever you want. And it, it's something that means something to your company. It could be like, you know, homepage production, homepage develop. It can be whatever it is that, ne that you need. Um, you get an empty bucket. And, and again, very empty. There's nothing in there. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my template file, the null template, the empty one, and I'm going to run new Azure RM resource group deployment on that. So I'm doing that now. And as you can see, I'm, I'm submitting the, uh, I'm doing a verbose output here so we can see some stuff. The template is valid. I've submitted it to Azure. It's a valid template. And uh, uh, Azure is, resource manager is now looking at the template saying, okay, let me provision these resources. And then it realizes that there are in fact no resources in my template. It's a valid template, but it's empty. So it just quits. Nothing happened. It's, it's fine. So let me just show you my really mad PowerShell skills here. I'm going to select this other template there. After the, the, the hashtag symbol there, I'm going to select the other template, the one with the storage account. I'm going to run that. Um, same thing. I'm submitting my template to Azure. Uh, and Azure is, is taking a look at this template to see what do we need to do here. Ah, we need to create a storage account. So let's go and do that. Um, <coughs> template is valid. and then. It takes uh, whatever time it takes to deploy this template and create this resource in Azure. Um, and hopefully it'll be kind of quick uh, and we'll, we'll be able to see the, uh, the storage account show up here in Azure. So the simplest possible thing, I'm just showing you the, the very, very basics um, here. 
Sometimes it takes a few seconds, but it shouldn't take all that long to create a storage account. It's a very fairly simple thing. So right now in um, Western Europe, I believe, yeah, there you go. In, in Western Europe, mm, a storage account was created for me to, to upload my files to and stuff. So now I have a blob storage account there and I can do tables and stuff in there. So I have an Azure resource. Okay, so far so good. It's simple, it's, 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 it's baseline stuff. What happens if I do this? I run the same template again. What happens? I'm running the same template that I just ran for creating a storage account. What's going to happen? That's correct. The answer is nothing. Because I specified exactly, I have the same parameter. There's actually no parameters. I specified the name. Um, it's um, the name of the storage account was Arm Training Magnus 42 was the name of the storage account. And I'm creating I'm recreating the same storage account and it's it's completed already. So what it what it, what it actually does what is is that executes the same template again, does nothing because it already checks all oh, that storage account's already there. So the the execution of, of templates is item potent. You can run the same one over and over again, nothing's gonna change. What also matters here is that you could have and we're gonna get come back well actually let's talk about that later. But it's item potent and you can run <coughs> run um, <coughs> in two modes. Uh, and I want to call that out because the default mode is incremental. Incremental means that it's going to, um, you always run one template on a, on a um, uh, resource group. So you specify the resource group. It says resource group name right there. So I'm, I'm running it on a specific resource group. And so it's incre incremental mode means that it'll just add whatever resources that you specify in your template to the resource group. But there's another mode called complete. If you run with this mode, it's not the default. If you run specifically with this mode, it will not only create the resources in your template in the resource group, it'll also go and delete every other resource which is there. So just so you know, be careful, because you could delete databases and what have you if you execute with complete. So know what you're doing there. So I think it's a good thing that the, the incremental mode is default. I think it's a probably a very good thing. So there we go. Um, baseline of running simplest possible template. Any questions? And I think I covered most of this. You use declarative templates, they are then you execute them in an item potent fashion. Uh, you can create multiple services. I just created one. You can create many with one template and, uh, and specify lots of things and you can put them in many regions because again, uh, resources in one resource group can have different locations. So it's really easy to do. Now, for a question. We know that we have resource groups, these buckets. Um, if I have an application like this one, it's a w it, it has three resources, apparently. It's uh, some sort of a web application there. It's a VM for some reason. There's a virtual machine involved. And there is a storage account. Let's say maybe you're using um, a specific server. Let's say you're using Oracle on the VM, running Oracle maybe, Oracle database on the VM. Um, and these are your resources that you're using in Azure. Should you put them in one resource group because they belong to the same application, or should you put them in separate individual resource groups? Which, which is better? One. one resource group? Anyone else? Huh? Separate? Okay, so we have both. Okay, one or separate. Uh, a hint is kind of if you have the same common lifecycle managers of this of ma lifecycle management of these resources, then they could be in the same resource group. They don't have to be. You can basically have one resource group for one resource if you want to go there. Uh, but um, in this scenario, let's play out a scenario, it kind of depends. Uh, let's say maybe the web application might come and go, but it's highly unlikely you want to delete your database. You probably want to keep your database. So it seems like possibly those two have separate life cycles, right? Possibly. So maybe they should be in different resource groups. But it really is up to you. You can do whatever you like, uh, as long as you know that it doesn't matter. This web application can talk to that VM or that storage account across resource groups. It's not a resource group is not a boundary of any kind in that way, not for access to them. So that's, that's, it doesn't matter like that. So <coughs> going into the next thing, we were talking before about environments and how you have many many environments. How many environments do you have, right? I mean, one or several testing environments. You have certainly have w at least one development environment, if not more. 
and, and some staging environment before you go into production, and then you have a production environment. So you have many of these environments uh, that you want to provision. You want them to be the same. But uh, so how do, I, how do I do this? How do I manage this? Do I need to have one template for each of my environments and make sure that they are equal? These template files, these JSON files, is that how I do it? Fortunately not. So you can use the same template on all of the environments and you can start using these parameters that I alluded to before. I showed you that you can, you can send in parameters and, and then you, you can have a parameter file, one file for each environment. So let me just quickly show you that as well. It's actually my, I only have two demos. Um, oh, I need to go back to off screen there. <laughs> and then we have this. Um, <coughs> Here we have uh, a bunch of environments specified. I made a little array here just to show my crazy PowerShell skills. Um, one development environment, one testing environment, and one production environment. So three environments, and uh, each one will have a different uh, file. Uh, I'm going to show you the files real quick, but I what I will be executing is this script block here uh, in a while. The script block will log into Azure. It will uh, select a specific subscription. It will select a, a create a resource group, and it'll run a deployment. That's what the script block does. So I'm going to actually fire this off, and while it's provisioning, and I'm, I'm going to talk about what I just did. So I'll do it for each over my, my environments, and I'll actually run them in the background. So you're really showing that I'm, I'm super cool with PowerShell. I'm not. Um, so you can actually run start job, which will run a piece of script in the background. So I'm running my, my, my background scripts there. You can see I can list the things that are running as a background job. The development, the testing, and the production environment are all deploying right now to Azure. So what am I deploying? Uh, I am deploying this. Uh, simplest, the, the second most simple thing, but it has a couple of resources is why I, I chose that, and, and it's using a few parameters. We have a website name uh, as one parameter, and we have a SKU name. I'm deploying a website, and the website has different sizes from free all the way up to premium. There are different sizes of web, web applications you can run in Azure, the, the web app resource. So that's a parameter. How big should my size be? And then there's another parameter for how many instances should my, um, should my uh, deployment have, just one web website instance or multiple. Um, so I can do that as a, a, a parameter. I'm specifying a couple of resources down here. So it's funny because <coughs> for um, a web application, you can't just have a web application. When you deploy a web application, you also automatically get a, 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 a web hosting plan. And this hosting plan, uh, an, an app that was actually called an app service plan. The app service plan is something you must have to be able to deploy a web app. So you have to have two resources to deploy a web app. You automatically get that. And, and it's funny because app service plan doesn't really tell us tech people anything at all. But if you look underneath the covers, you'll notice that the type of an app service plan is in fact a server farm. So an app service plan, plan is a server farm. That's what you're deploying if you're deploying, well, the trivial case is to deploy one instance and it's a server farm with one server. And if you deploy multiple, you'll get multiple instances in your server farm. But it, on the surface, the marketing people probably thought it was better to call that an app service plan because it, I probably said, like, farm? Are we farmers? No, <laughs> we can't have that. So the marketing people just turned that into an app service plan and now the tech people, goes, what the heck is an app service plan? Well, it's a server farm. Oh. Why don't you call it a server farm? And, and it's funny because uh, the next thing it just continues like that. The, the web app, the Microsoft web app uh, uh, resource, if you look underneath the covers, it's actually called a Microsoft.web slash sites. So it's in fact a website underneath the covers, but you know, marketing department again, websites, that's kind of old, right? It's all about the app now. So we're talking apps, we're being really cool. So they rebranded or named, it's actually called websites in the beginning, and then now it's called web apps, but the resource underneath the covers is still a site. There you go. Ah, uh, that's, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Screw you. Um, it's not wrong, uh, it's, 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 it's my truth, it's, it's my um, alternative facts. Anyways, these two resources are a web uh, application. 
You have to have both, and both of them are deployed with my template. And as you can see, again, we have these parameters. So let's just jump to the parameters. We have the development environment. It's going to send in <coughs> a website name, because the name needs to be unique. And it's going to send in um, uh, the, environment, um, the environment name, just development. That it's a tag uh, that I'm using. I'm going to show you later. Um, but that means that we're going to use the default value for the SKU name. That's another parameter, which I could have specified. I'm going to show you that I'm doing that for the other ones. So the, the default size will be F1, which is the free tier of web application. And the default value of the capacity is 1. So I'm going to have one free web application for my development environment. Makes sense. Nobody's really browsing to that. We just want to make sure that it deploys. On my testing environment, though, we have actual testers doing actual testing work and making sure that the testing that that, that you know the application works as it's supposed to be doing. And so I'm using uh, another SKU, another size there, not the free tier. I'm using the B1 tier instead, a slightly larger um, uh, web application, and uh, still just one instance though. But for production, um, I'm going uh, up to a, a standard one size uh, web application for production. And I'm using a SKU capacity of two instances instead. So by specifying these parameters in the parameter files, and then taking these parameter files as an additional, there it is, template parameter file, as an additional parameter to my uh, call to when I'm creating things, I'm saying use this template and use these parameters. I can then use the same template with different parameters and execute it many times. So I'll get these uh, results up in Azure. Up in Azure, um, let me go to my resource groups again. I have now all my three resource groups, and if we drill into these, uh, let's go to the production one. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> You'll notice that I have a web application and an app service plan. Uh, app service is called, and an app service plan. I have them um, for each of my resource groups. So that's how you do it. That's how you. Make sure that you get the same resources, maybe of different sizes for different environments and so on and so forth because of you know, saving money and all that. But you have the same resources exactly because you use just one template for your different environments. It's highly convenient. All right. Thoughts so far? Yes. I did. I did have a capacity of two for the production. So you're only seeing one? Here is your brilliant question. Um, love that question. Um, I did have a capacity of two, so you, sh you were expecting to see two web applications. Well, it's actually just one application, but if I drill into my app service plan, which is the size and a c number of instances for my web farm, right? It is a f web farm. If I drill into this thing and I go to the scale out tab on this thing, um, scale out is the number of instances, and the number of instances is two. If I go to the other ones, the number of instances will be one. So this is where I scale the horizontally scale the number of instances. If I hit save here, I'm going to create 10 S1s, and it's kind of unnecessary to do that, but that's what's going to happen if I do, and it's costing actual money. Do it, do it, do it. OK, I'll do it. All right, so I'm scaling to 10 instances just because he said do it. Uh, I just had a dare. Uh, I can afford it. That's fine. It's a Microsoft account, actually. <laughs> it's, the, it's the one they give to MVPs um, that I can do demos on. So anyways, um, there you go. So now I have 10 instances instead of the two, OK? Uh, what I'm actually going to do, just because the uh, reason I did it, not because I can't stand a deer, but the fact that I can actually delete them all in the background here real quick. So bye 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 all the resources. And that's, that's doing a, remo a delete, a delete uh, resource group thing in the background here. So all of these uh, environments will now go away again. Which actually is a good point to, uh, place to, to say that if you have testing environments and you have test things you want to run, what you can do, and I've seen this done several times now, you probably use some sort of a source code repository and some sort of a build server. It doesn't matter which one you use. You could use, you know, use your Team City or use your Visual Studio Team Services, whatever it is that builds your code for you automatically on the server side. Use whatever you like. But what you can do with those is you can run a task, either run a PowerShell task or run uh, a specialized ARM deployment task. So what I've literally seen is I've seen people push code to their repository. The code is pulled and built, and uh, unit tests are run. And then there is a step where actual resources in Azure are provisioned using a template. 
and deployment happens onto those resources automatically by the build server uh, onto that, those resources. Uh, automated test suite is run and uh, data is collected and then the resources are auto automatically also deleted from Azure using uh, delete command to, to remove the resources again. So you can literally provision resources within a test run and you will only be paying money to Microsoft for the, the minutes, the seconds, what have you, the amount of time that you have those resources provisioned. You can automate the entire process start to finish and I've seen that done and it's actually quite cool when you see it. In fact, I, what, I, what I saw that time was <coughs> they weren't actually creating resources, they were just scaling them. So they basically scaled the website down to a free tier and they kept it there and then they, they scaled it up to like a standard tier or something and then they ran some tests and then they scaled it down again. It's pretty cool. So they're not really paying for much at all. So it's completely possible to automate all the way. Did you get the, the uh, link tweeted out? It's done? Cool, thank you. So there we go. So far, so good. Now, tooling. It looks like you're deploying something to the cloud. Let's talk about tooling. Tooling for ARM. Um, it is Microsoft, so there's lots of tools to manage Azure. In fact, uh, Brady will be talking about some of those tools in his talk uh, today, afternoon, 3 something, 2.30, is Brady's talk about the, tooling, about the Azure tooling for uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, so th there's lots of toolings, uh, tooling that you could use. Uh, you could use the portal, you could use the, the UX, and there's the IDEs you can uh, deploy from Visual Studio, from Visual Studio Code. Uh, you could use PowerShell. Uh, Visual Studio Code is really cool. And I, was, um, I need to make like a, a pit stop here because we're now talking about a world where <coughs> the way to manage resources has changed very dramatically from what we knew. We had an IT department, right? And, and uh, we'd walk to the ID, IT department and say, I, I need a new database for this project. We'd go over to the IT department and we'd knock on the door and they'd be really annoyed. And we'd have to like wait in line or something. And, and eventually it'd be our turn and be like, I need a database. And they'd be like, <laughs> database, right, here's a form, right? And you'd fill out the form and you'd ask them like, like please, when, when can I have my database? Well, uh, we have a shipment of disks and some RAMs coming in in like three weeks. And you're gonna, we're gonna have to install them and upgrade the, the SQL server and then uh, say two months, right? And that was true, true in many organizations, real, I mean, true story, it, that happened. In Azure, it's like, pfft, right? You either do it yourself or they just go, click, there you go, database. Yeah, like 50 of those, all right, 50, click. I mean, it's that simple, it's absolutely crazy. So, so it's really changed quite dramatically. And now, um, sure, you can write really intricate PowerShell commands. Uh, I mean, all of the, the things, you can create a storage account using a PowerShell special commandlet, and you can create a VM using a really complicated commandlet, and VNets and subnets, and specify all these things, and storage accounts, like a really, really intricate thing. But what you should be doing is not doing that, because I call that job security because the people who write those very complicated PowerShell commandlets are the only ones who can actually figure out what the heck they're doing. Um, so instead you should abstract out and build these templates that I've been showing you. I've been showing you like the craziest, simplest possible template, but the template for a virtual machine which has five, six resources, uh, storage accounts, virtual networks, network interface cards, IP addresses and a bunch of stuff. Like a, a virtual machine is a pretty complicated beast in terms of Azure resources. Uh, a, a normal standard template for a VM can be a couple of hundred lines of, of, uh, of resources, of uh, uh, JSON. So it's much larger than what I've shown you. And that's just one VM, right? I mean, it can be really complicated. But I, I, I urge you guys to start simple and go towards complicated when you need it. Don't start and go overboard. Um, but the point here is things are really changing. and. Change is scary. So I, I always use, I love this picture, I use that as a backdrop for talking about change because human beings don't like change, right? We, we, it sh we shun it, it's, it's dangerous. Um, and this is of course, as you can all see, this is an automobile. It is a, a, a wagon which is automatically able to be mobile on its own without a horse. So this was really scary for some people. They were like, ah, it's the wagon of death. 
And you know, they were doing cross signs and things. It was really scary. So they, they you, know, you know, to cushion the blow for people who didn't like that change, they would sometimes mount this, this horse's head figure at the front of the, the carriage. And some of the early designs of these had a whip holder. Because I mean, if you don't have a whip holder, where are you gonna put the whip, right? That's important. And change, right? So for the IT department, there's lots of change. Some people may not like it. It's not less true. In the beginning, there was lots of excitement about how we wouldn't need IT anymore. I apologize, that was never true. But the early exuberant people jumping around saying, oh, platform service is really cool, didn't understand. I didn't like managing resources back then, and I don't like it today. So I'll still have IT people, except that some of their tasks will be different. And change can be scary. So now, uh, that's what I wanted to mention when I'm talking about the Visual Studio Code. Somehow, the, um, it's not a normal work task for a typical IT pro person to be using source control and checking in and out files, and that's, not th that's developer stuff, right? Code files and stuff. But now it's infrastructure as code. Now it's the, the ARM templates, the files containing JSON specifying resources that you can still check into a Git repository and have version control on. And you can actually share these across teams and between people. And you can open up one of these files and you can actually read it and it makes sense. You can use it for something. It's not this arcane, strange knowledge of writing complicated uh, commandlet uh, call requests on the command line that only a few people can actually do. It's it's um, democratized the process, if you will, but it's also empowered IT so much, and they won't be in installing Visual St uh, Visual Studio full blown Visual Studio on their systems anytime soon because there's a license cost, and Visual Studio is a pretty massive program to install. The answer is roughly well, they could consider installing Visual Studio Code because you can edit JSON and templates in there, you can run things in there with the tooling, you can check in stuff using Git. Um, there are some new skills that, that these people might need to acquire, but Visual Studio Code is free. So it's, it's a good tool for that. That's probably the go-to tool for, for um, more IT pro people that don't actually develop stuff, uh, don't write code. They would probably go there. But it's a big change and I realize that. There's PowerShell that I've shown you, and there's also the Azure command line interface, the um, well, many names, Azure CLI, the uh, XPlat CLI. It's the command line interface, and this thing is implemented in Python. It installs on any system. You can run it on a Mac, you can run it on Linux, you can run it on Windows, and it just works. It's actually very, com I like it a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm better at PowerShell, and I'm not good at PowerShell, but, but Azure command line uh, is, is actually very declarative, very cool. It's, it's stuff like, AZ web app create, basically, right? It's very, very declarative, uh, the statements, statements that you make. And you can go from code. You can call from code, and this is an example of that. It's the Fluent interface, uh, which you can have this specifies a virtual machine with region, with resource group, with primary, with primary network, with et, et cetera, et cetera. So you can write, this is uh, C sharp. So uh, an SDK in C Sharp with a fluent interface for, for creating resources. I've seen a, a customer of mine once, uh, they were running load tests and they had their own spe special load test servers that they were provisioning in Azure, running load tests for their customers. They created a portal where their customers could go to the portal and requisition and, uh, you know, a load test. I have this web thing over here and the following load tests I'd like you to run on my machines to, to, to give it a test. And, and they would provision in the portal and say, at this time, I want the test to start with this load and so forth. And that would actually spin up individual virtual machines in Azure for this test and run uh, this, these machines uh, as, as uh, created by the customer in the portal. And they would, of, of course, uh, launch them using code. So you can do that. It's pretty cool. Now, um, I told you that the, the uh, bottom line here is a RESTful interface, right? There's this management layer, a RESTful interface. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you the secret about Azure. Would you like to know the secret, the real secret? All right, I'll tell you right now. The actual secret about Azure, and this is another site you can browse to resource, ah, let me get out of that again. I keep doing that. Um, resources azure.com, if you browse to that, how, am, how many have done that? Have you seen this? That's very few, it's like a handful, um, six, seven have seen this. 
And a bunch of these features are incorporated into the Azure portal now, so you can see this inside of the Azure portal as well, but it's, it was here before. And it still, it still says preview up there, it's, it's a little funky. But resources.azure.com allows you to browse right down into your resources. Now, if I go down to my subscriptions, this um, uh, sign-in doesn't have many subscriptions, only five. Um, and I'll go to my sponsorship one. I actually deleted the web application. That's, that's fine. I can use uh, like a storage account or what have you. I can go down to, um, actually, let's go to, let's go to my, my corporate website. Don't ever browse to my corporate website. It's embarrassing. I'm, I'm about to change it. It's one of those things that never gets done. Um, but if I go down to LoftySoft Corporate, uh, Resources, no, Providers, I can scroll down in here. And, and sort of burrow down to my web resources, server farms and sites, as you recall. I have a couple of sites down there. Um, here we go. A couple of test things that I'm running, as you can see. But did this, this is the actual resource, the actual Azure resource for loftysoft.com, my web application for my, ho for my company, okay? Um, and and um, you can see that there's a URL thing up here. Let me, is zooming in okay? Uh, yeah, it's all right. So as you can see, it, it talks to management.azure.com. It talks to that endpoint. And then there's a WAC subscriptions, and then there's the unique subscription identifier for my subscription. It's not a secret or anything. Every, every subscription has one. And there's a, a resource group called LoftySoft Corporate. Um, and a provider, it's my provider slash providers, it's Microsoft.web slash sites, so it's a website. It's called LoftySoft. So what is this thing that I'm showing you here? Well, it's a, it's a URL, right? You can browse to it. It's an endpoint that you can talk to. But it's also a URI. It's the unique identifier for my, my um, corporate web application. Um, it's, it's exactly that. And you can see that we start from the top and we say which subscription. Then we go on to which resource group and then which resource, right? Which resource type and then which resource specific resource name. So. If your subscription is like the root of a tree, then all of your um, resource groups would be branches. And then all of your resources would be the leaves inside of those, those trees, right? So if you have many subscriptions, as I have here, several subscriptions, you have a little forest going, right? So we're tech people. We can wrap our heads around this concept of a tree. It's not scary or strange or, or dangerous at all. Resources in a tree, a leaf need to be on one branch. So you understand that a resource has to be in just one resource group. It can't be in multiple resource groups. And you can have multiple re leafs or resources in, in one branch, one resource group. It makes sense. So really, it's a tree, and, and it's, a, it's a forest. So you all thought that the, 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 the cloud, that Azure was a cloud. Azure isn't a cloud. Azure is, in fact, a forest. So that is the secret of Azure that you didn't know. But now you do. And it kind of gives you a mental model for, for how to sort things. Because if you're doing Azure and you have hundreds of resources, how do I, wow. I mean, have you pressed all resources in the portal when you have 100? Ugh, which one is which, right? It's really complicated. So I'm going to move along because of time. Uh, I'm going to quickly state that you can go here on GitHub. There is a Azure quit, Quick Start templates. There's like several hundreds of templates there. You can go there and you can look at professional templates that people have contributed from the community to this Microsoft repository. That accept uh, th this repository accepts pull requests. There are some really good templates here for anything you want to create. You can maybe start there and just take a look at some templates that are complicated and large. There are like templates for SharePoint farms here. Like you, really big things that you can can uh, download and, and just browse through and start from there. It's a good good resource to start from. So real quickly, um, the cloud the ARM model is an enabler, right? So we're going to talk. We talked about how access control plays into this. <coughs> uh, Role-based access control is applied to Azure. Before role-based access control in Azure, you had access to a subscription either as the owner of the subscription or as a co-administrator, which means that it was completely binary. You had either access to nothing in the, re in the subscription or to everything. 
and how people then uh, managed to separate separa environments from each other was to have one subscription for production and another for development and so forth. That was how you kind of handled access, and it wasn't good, uh, obviously. I mean, that's not the way to do it. So with role-based access control, you can specify uh, granular permissions to have access to a specific resource group as a reader or contributor. It actually goes all the way down to um, uh, all the way down to individual resources. There are built-in roles such as owner, contribu contributor, reader, etc. But you can create custom roles uh, for for spe very specific things, and that's very handy. Um, it's a top-down structure. The same. This tree comes back again. You can see basically the owner of the subscription up there. This red shirt guy is probably Scott Guthrie, right? And uh, and mid-level tier here people who own a resource group, maybe a specific project has a resource group and a project manager, and there's a dev guy there, but you know that because he has a shirt that says 404, and, and then he has people working, you know, these people are working on the teams, and they are, have access to the specific resources. And you can grant, you know, um, uh, owner, contributor, reader, and, and so forth uh, to these things. So you can have a development team which are contributing maybe to a, contri to a, a development resource group, but they maybe are only readers in the production resource group. So they can see the stuff that is in production, but they can't change it. And, and that's actually a very good thing because they can't accidentally delete the production database. Right? They, don't, they don't have access to do that. So that's how that works. Um, you go into access control. This, uh, I call you click on the little people symbol. And you can apply, you can select a group of people, or, or you can select uh, individual people and, and assign access. Um, Key learnings in this area is that you do want to use uh, organizational accounts for accessing your resources. You can sign in using Microsoft accounts. And I was at a large com uh, company, and they had 13 subscriptions, bunch of deployments in the, in the range of 150 resource groups and many, many resources. And uh, the, their lead architect was proudly showing me all the stuff they had. You know, he was really he was proud about his, his achievement of using Azure. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. All the while, I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that he's signing in with his, uh, not his organizational account, with a Microsoft account, with a live account, a Hotmail. He's signing in. And he gets root access to all of the subscriptions from that. So quite literally, they are one password away from giving up complete access to everything they have. I would say there's not a security audit in the world that that would ever pass. Now what you need to do is move to organizational accounts and sign in with your company accounts. I always sign in with my magnus at loftysoft.com account. And that's not even the admin of all these resources. Sometimes I'm not the admin. I have a separate account to sign in with and I have, I have, I have uh, multi-factor authentication enabled on that. So I really want to be make sure that I don't have root access to everything when I sign in. And that's, that's the model that you're going for. Uh, you manage access using groups. You have a, a team of developers. You don't go and add you, 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 and oh, you as well individually to that resource group. You create a group in your, your AD, and you add the people to the group, and you assign access to the group. And all of the people in the group will have the access, um, and so forth. Uh, least privilege applies. And then you can also monitor changes in access. You can monitor this. OK, we um, need to jump to the next one, and it's tagging resources. So you can tag resources, and that's um, a way for you to see that you can have cost control. You can be geo-compliant and, and all these things. Um, tags um, um, allows you to, there are, there are a bunch of cha challenges. Actually, this doesn't apply only to tags, but there are a bunch of things that you want to be able to do. Uh, you have lots of resources. Who owns what? Who's r whose database is that? That big database there costing us money. Who's, whose project is this? Who's running that database? Who owns that? You don't know when you have you know, 200 resources. It's difficult to see. But with tags, you can say, well, the department is R&D. So this database apparently belongs to R&D. And tags are key value pairs that you're able to apply to any resource. Uh, you decide the key, department maybe, or, you know, of Dalning, if you want to do Swedish, it doesn't matter. You can go with whatever. Um, and the, you, d you supply the value. And you can search for anything that, uh, any resource belonging to the department R&D. 
you can find all those resources. It's pretty cool that you can do that. Um, you can filter out certain tags. You can find out then who owns. You can say within our company we have to have an owner, somebody responsible, a project manager or something. You can, you can have a tag called PM for project manager and then you can have the name of that guy or the email of that guy. So you know who is responsible for the resources. You specify these things. So in, um, um, in Azure again, what you would do in the portal um, is this. I have my arm for the win resource group here and if I want to tag it, Let's say this is R&D. I can go in and say, department is R&D. And I can save. And now I've tagged this with the key dep for department and the value R&D. I can have 15 tags like this on, on, on any resource group, on any resource. Uh, and with this, I can make sure that I know who owns what. You should have policies inside of your company saying you have to have tags. You have to tell everyone else who owns what resource because a large virtual machine may be super critical and shouldn't be shut down but if somebody sees this resource and it's really expensive they may like like whose is this i don't know i'll shut it down yes you can specify and i'll tell yes you, the question is you can sp can you specify that you have to set a spe specific tag the answer is yes and i love the question because i'll give you 20 bucks after um, so you can, you can apply policy to Azure and, and, and you would apply policy to your subscriptions and actually uh, uh, announced last week at Build, uh, sorry, Build, Ignite. I was in Orlando last week's week at the Ignite conference. They announced like now you have a sort of a middle layer here, one level up from the subscription where you can specify, um, I don't know the name of that, I can't remember. You can now specify uh, sort of management principles, uh, policies that will apply to all of your subscriptions. Uh, so that if you only create new uh, subscriptions, you can apply the same policies to all of your subscriptions and sort of manage things more easily. There's a new policy center, which I haven't even seen myself in Azure now. Um, policies let you define custom rules that govern the shape of your resources. So you can enforce, enforce such things as naming conventions limit which types of instances can be deployed. I mean, a developer maybe thinks that it's kind of cute and funny if he deploys a Godzilla-sized machine to run his tests on, but a Godzilla-sized machine is freaking expensive. So if he thinks it's funny, the guy who pays the bill maybe thinks it's not so funny. So you can actually say if the size of a virtual machine is Godzilla-sized, deny. Um, typically, um, you can require a tag. You can say you have to specify department tag. If you don't, then I will deny your deployment. So um, uh, a policy in its raw form looks like this. It's a, uh, well, surprise, it's a piece of JSON. If something, if the tag department is missing, then the effect would be to deny the thing. It will always be audited. You can also make changes to it. So let me give you quickly a couple of examples of that. So if not the location is in West Europe or North Europe, then deny, which means that in this subscription or in the wherever, wherever this policy is applied, you're only allowed to choose two, re two regions and they have to be in Europe. We're not deploying anything over in Asia or anywhere else, we're dealing with Europe only. So any resource not having uh, the location West Europe or Northern Europe will not be uh, uh, deployed, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you're a developer and you deploy something and you break a policy, what type of feedback do you get? Well, if it's like in this case, you're going to get a deployment failure and it's going to say in, in angry red letters, it's going to say you broke the, po the following policy. And that will also always be audited so that you can actually go in afterwards and see who tried to do that. Maybe the person got it wrong and tried to do something which was against company policy. Maybe just a naming policy or something that they didn't adhere to. So you can, you can literally be, because this is audited, you can literally, if you want to be, you can be alerted on this. You can get an email or call a webhook or get it even, in, well, I guess mo maybe only in the US, you can get even get a text message sent to you saying somebody just, this, this event just occurred, as in somebody just broke a policy. Uh, the, the, the good thing is that you can get, have the effect deny. Uh, here's another version of that, exactly what you were asking about. 
uh, if the tags field contains, uh, if it does not contain costs a cost center tag, the name cost center, then deny the deployment. You have to have a cost center applied to all the deployments. That's how we do things. Funny enough, when you create resources in the Azure portal, you can't specify tags. So if somebody applies this policy to your subscription, uh, you can't actually use the Azure portal to create resources, which is a little bit funny. So you can mess with people. Yes. Can you have enumerations there? Like specific yes, you can have enumerations as well. You can have, it, it needs to be in a certain range, certain values that are valid. Other values are not valid. Uh, but this is the evil manager version, right? This is the unless thou shalt do this, otherwise denied. It's the evil manager version. But let's say you're working in R&D, and here's the one which is a little bit more of an eye, eye chart, you know, it's like read the bottom line. Um, let me uh, zoom into that. Um, it's difficult to zoom when I have a split screen, but oh, that doesn't work at all. Um, it's, it's all right. If the field tag exists, if the cost center does not exist, then append, not deny, it's, it's off again, crap. Let's not do that. Let's not do this thing. The zooming does not work. It's not a good thing. Go away. I tried. Let's not do it. I can actually zoom when it's not in, in presentation mode. So if the tags field exist and there's a cost, there isn't a cost center tag, then append the cost center to be and, and the value R and D, so you can make a change to the a policy that actually changes the shape of the resources that you are deploying. You're adding a tag, and and in, in this case it would actually be a good thing because if you are the R and D department and you're creating and deleting resources all day, you're probably doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're R and Ding, right? You're supposed to create and delete resources. That's what you do. So uh, this is the, the nice manager version where you get help. Uh, and, and if you forgot the, the, the cost center tag, we'll just apply that for you. And then there's also the audit version, which just keeps record of what you did. And then uh, the manager can come and yell at you and say, why the hell did you create a Godzilla size machine? I've told you a million times, right? So there you go. So uh, with policy evaluation, a request can be blocked, modified. Uh, audit events are always generated. And from the audits, I told you, you can get alerts. So um, ARM, an infrastructure as code, these JSON templates, this tagging stuff, these policies are all features that are in the Azure platform, but most people don't know about them and don't know how to use them effectively. Only less than half this room had ever seen an ARM template. And, uh, and um, hopefully you guys saw something new today with the policies and the tags and things that, that will help you. But really, it's, it's about learning the nuts and bolts, the inner workings, the fundament upon which you put your resources. And if you get that much better, well, then so much the better, right? You remove human error and you have your security control. You can apply uh, access control to this and you can make sure that the right people have access to the right things. There's actually one more thing. I, was a I started a couple of minutes late because of tech, so I'm going to run a couple of minutes late. Um, really, uh, honestly, this is, this is very cool. Uh, that you can do these things. Uh, you can um, um, you can create uh, something I was going to say. Um, yes, there's privileged identity management, and and finally, uh, this is a feature of Azure Active Directory of your AD. Um, it, it's been available for other other things such as f Office 365 and and so forth. But they're they're coming out now. It's I think it's in public preview at this point privileged identity management for uh, Azure subscriptions or Azure resources as well, which means that literally you can create a specific role for maybe doing a swap from staging to production. Let's say you want to do that sometimes, but you don't want to always do it. And at some point, you're going to roll a new version into production. Maybe there should be a specific requirement there, a specific toll gate. And that permission is granted to maybe a specific person but with privileged identity management, you can make it so that it's not active all the time. When the person wants to do that specific action of swapping, you can create a custom role, I want to swap to production. They can go and request elevation of privileges and say, I want to activate, I want to elevate that role right now, the elevation of my access rights so that I can now, for a brief 
you know, few hours, I am allowed to swap to production. But that will expire and the right to do so will go away again, and which is really good because that means that I can't accidentally swap to production when I didn't mean to. And that's uh, governed by privileged identity management. And all these things are there. And, and, and it all boils down to you saving and, and, and being more secure, being more efficient, being more automated. And, and whenever you say that word, you have to actually say it three times. It's like a spell. You can't just say it once. You have to say automation, automation, automation. Uh, it's th three times or no times. Um, that's what it's all about. You have to go there and you have to do that stuff. So before I go, we're out of time, but do you have any follow-up questions on this? Thoughts? Personal attacks? Anything? Yes? Personal attack, then. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Armvis.io is a good place to go to. Yeah. If your ARM template goes very grows very big, there is a place called armwiz.io that you could go to. I agree. That's uh, that's nice. Because if sometimes your template becomes very big, and, and the thing that I didn't cover here is dependencies. If you're deploying a virtual machine, you need to deploy the storage accounts for the, the, the VHD files first, right? So the, the, the virtual machine depends on the storage accounts. So there's interdependencies between your resources, a thing that I didn't have time to cover here. And your template can become quite large and complicated. I told you, it can be hundreds of lines of JSON. And at that point, you kind of maybe want to have a visualizer. And there are a couple of visualizers available that you can make you, like you can see what's in my, my, uh, my template. But once you get into it, it's not all that difficult to wrap your head around these resources. In Visual Studio, there's tooling to see which resources are in my template as well. You can see a list of them and, uh, and their specifications and so forth. Yeah, so good, good input. Uh, yeah, since we're out of time, we're about to wrap. You can catch me in the halls as well. So there are new types of challenges in the cloud. You need to learn to manage Azure the right way, the proper way, not do this happy-go-lucky thing with my Microsoft account and I'm just deploying things from the portal and I'm doing it manually. You can do that, but it's not the right way to do it. Um, so use Azure Resource Manager and, and do it the better way. And oh, by the way, I'm shamelessly going to plug my workshop. I do have a workshop that I've developed on this area where if you need this knowledge inside of your company, you can do a workshop on this. Um, you can you know, reach out to me about it. And uh, we can schedule that for you. That's it. I'm done. Thank you for your patience. Um, do enjoy the rest of the conference. Let's take a 10-minute break and uh, be back in, in, in 10 minutes. Um, Go get coffee and those things and then come back. Thank you. <laughs>